Hey, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to episode two of ISS Ask Me Anything. It's Mike, uh, your favorite educator interviewer here with Dana, who is our director of learning and research and outreach. And Dana, who do we have with us today? Today, we have Paul O'Neill, and he ran this amazing workshop for us on personal branding and what that looks like as an educator and how we might use this within our schools and as teachers. And it was absolutely fabulous. And so we're going to ask him some questions. Ask me anything. Absolutely. So we had a few questions come over from individuals, and we'll also be asking our own questions as well. We also have a few guests with us today who will ask their own questions, but I want to start off with one where you spoke about uh, what the course is called digital branding, but I just wanted to know, is there a difference between digital branding and personal branding? I think technically not really. I mean, this was a discussion we had early on at the, when we chose the topic, and I think we chose digital because it was less confronting around the personal, you know, like the word personal has a, I guess, some baggage in it in terms of recruitment. So that's where I think we chose the digital because we wanted to reflect the sort of curation of evidence for, through digital platforms that come together to tell the picture. So I think there's a slide in the slide deck that basically says they're the same thing. It's just about how the information is presented, which is where the digital work came from. Okay. One question that I saw Someone posed in the two stars and a wish activity that you had them do was um, how does one get started when they're really not confident with like how to integrate social media and teaching? So like what would be your first step if they want to start sharing some of their teaching methods and things that are happening in their classroom and social media, where would you suggest they start? I think for me, and I don't know that I emphasize this enough in the workshop, I think the storytelling part is, is the rich part. And the social media is just the channel that you share it on, you know. So I think a good place to start is to use your digital images and write little stories, you know, little stories about things that happen that relate to, you know, some of the big ideas that identify who you are as an individual. Because what you're trying to do is tell the story of you through a digital lens, but relating to these big beliefs that you have about education, which you've articulated through in a sense, is your brand. You know, those big ideas are really the brand. And so the story is a, how you explain that brand to people through a real story. For my money, I would be encouraging people to write small stories about little things that happened and use those. Because if you look at Twitter, we know there's only 150 or 180 characters or whatever, but you can tell a lot of story, those amount of words. So that's where I'd be starting. Like I said at the end, start somewhere. <laughs> because... This isn't about using social media in the classroom. This is about using social media to add value and to document with evidence examples of your work. So it's very different to using it, I think, to using it in the classroom as a, as a learning tool. Can I have a follow-up question on that one? So hmm? one of the things that, like, when we talk about stories, I think it's really important for everyone to be able to, like, have ownership of their story. And to me, that's really like about building a portfolio. And one of the questions someone had was, do you have a preference on where you build your portfolio and where you create your own personal brand and digital footprint online? Do you have a preference for what you use for to build that? Yeah. And I wouldn't say I, I went hunting for these things. I think it just fell into place. And it's pretty simple. I think for me, I use LinkedIn and Twitter. So LinkedIn is my portfolio. And Twitter is my professional networking tool, my professional learning network. Of course, there are the peripheral things. You know, if I was still in a school doing a, working on a project, I would have a YouTube channel with all of that information coming out. And I'd probably have a LinkedIn group based on a big idea of, say, if it was entrepreneurship or whatever. And if I was in a classroom, I might need Facebook. So I'd probably create a Facebook profile that was purely an educational one because my Facebook it's just about keeping in touch with family and friends, you know, which isn't necessarily much part of my digital brand, if you like. So, yeah, so for me, it's simple. It's just hacking LinkedIn to sort of do what you wanted to do in terms of curating things for you. And Twitter is how to build your professional learning network. I have a question. So I come from millennial era, so came from one page resumes where that was very important, where you can't even go to the second page. 
Now with digital brand, I wanted to ask, you know, is there any limitation just like the resume or can you just kind of go on to a plethora of all your skill sets? It's a good question, Mark. There's two ways of looking at this. You've got to remember that along with the CV is the search, the job fair, those kinds of recruitment tools will probably slowly shrink and other tools will probably come up. For me, I would err on the side of, I find a one-page CV an insult. You know, someone who's done a lot of stuff, to filter out the things to fit onto one page, you know, to edit it down to that, to me, feel a little bit insulting when you've got a lot to share. So for me, I would err on the side of share everything because there's two ways that this will work. There'll still be that pathway where a CV or a document gets sent to an agency. But most of the people I hire are people I find. And that's where this stuff is really important because I don't know what the latest figure is, but I think it's $120,000 a year is a costly thing for hiring the wrong person. So to put all your trust in an agency's method to collect CVs and, and pass mm-hmm. them off and filter them accordingly to the criteria is taking a risk. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying I wouldn't rely on that solely. I would use those. My thing is that where is the action in this particular field? So say we're talking about English language learners, you know, where's the, where's the really good action happening? What's a good one look like? Where is this really getting traction? And when you go to those places, you find people that are fully immersed in it and may just be interested in moving over. So I've had more success in finding people through LinkedIn and going to them and saying, hey, I've noticed your profile. I'm really interested in what you're doing. I'm not offering you a job yet, but to me, that's a different conversation to posting a CV and waiting for a, waiting for a response from mm-hmm. a school or an agency. And Mike, mm-hmm. if I can add uh, to you know, Paul's response, because it's a really good question. What I found as a head of school uh, evaluating resumes, whether they're in print in the old style, one or two pages, or digitally now on LinkedIn, think of a layered approach. I scan quickly first for what jobs did you have? Where did you have them? What's your academic background? So the way a, you know, a traditional outline looks, those stand out as bold headings. Then when beneath those, that's when I can go back and look at the richness of that person's experience in a particular location or a particular job. So it really isn't all or nothing, all could be there. It's just the way you lay it out and layer it for the audience of that particular resume. Okay. So resumes used to be like, a, I feel like a one one piece fits all. So digital brand, you'd say not so much? I wouldn't say so because all it tells you is where you've been. (laughs) You know, it doesn't tell you what you've done and or what you've achieved necessarily. And there's still a school of thought that will put faith in, wow, this person's been to these big schools or this person's worked for these big companies. They must be good. (laughs) You know, it's almost like deferring the the hiring choice to someone who hired them before. Mm -hmm. You know, like they must be good because... Apple hired them, for example. To extend your question too, Mike, I think a very limited approach would be to take your CV and just hyperlink out of your CV into things. You know, mm-hmm. even if you write a little story about, you know, I taught at such and such a school and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, here's a link to my blog where I talk about this, this and this. You know, so you open the door to more things through that traditional model. And that could be the simplest place to start. Okay. Paul, I was thinking too, when you were talking, like for me, the resume is the first step, right? Like it's like the precursor. And then I want to dig deeper and whether it's hyperlinks or whatever the situation is, when I'm looking at someone and I see that, you know, someone has lived in another country and they've worked at a certain school, I Google them to see what they've done at that school. And if there's nothing, if I can't Google them and find anything about them, that is a little bit of a flag for me. Like I want to see them engaging in that country, in that community, and doing things within the context of that school in a visual way so that I can say, okay, this, it helps me see a window into what they're doing. So they don't just exist on a piece of paper because we can all make a piece of paper sound great. Right. Mm, Yeah. But like actually seeing it and that's that action piece. And that's where I think the branding really comes into play. Mm. And with what Dana is saying, with the searchable being search, being able to be searchable on these search engines, would you recommend that individuals definitely be on multiple platforms or is one platform okay in today's age? There's a lot to that, I think, because 
people understanding how they can make their material more discoverable is is an important skill and you know even just knowing that you know hashtags are important but not too many you know things like that so being really succinct about the kinds of mechanisms you use to choose to make your work discoverable but i think yeah the more platforms you use a lot of those platforms are integrated now so you know if you post on instagram it'll automatically ask you if it wants to post in other places so it's not that hard to do what you've asked so yes unless you want to go into a full soe course and learn how to pay for you know google words and so forth i don't Mm -hmm. think you know i think we've just got to work with what we've got yeah so i you know i think that's probably good advice well one thing that i did when i first started working ed tech was i came up with kind of a name for myself and then i decided to just like register myself on every social media platform ever Now, I don't use all of them in the same capacity, but I just wanted to make sure that I had it. So if at some point within my career, I wanted to use it, I had it. So I took just my last name and then I put teach because I felt like I was always, so I made it teach Watts so that I was always learning, but I was also the teacher. So teach me and I'm teaching others. But anyway, I did that on like platforms that no longer even still exist. But what's interesting is like, I'll hear about one at a conference and I'm like, wait a minute, that kind of sounds familiar. I'll go to sign up. I'm like, oh, I've already signed up like literally like 2006, but it's great because then I own it. So someone else didn't already take that brand away from me, right? Like normally if I look for that now, it's mine. And I think like finding a way to like do something catchy with your name that brands you is also helpful. And then you can just you know, it doesn't cost anything for most of these things to sign it up. And then you just have that as a placeholder. So when you're ready to go and explore, you kind of have that component. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is that that Nick Garvin guy, whose CV I shared in the workshop, Nick's been um, navigating a, a career change, I'd say, potentially. And he's getting right into crypto and Bitcoin and NFTs and all this sort of business at quite a high level, you know, and you're sure he's lost money, but he's, he's made money. And uh, when I asked him if we could use this, his CV, he said, oh, yeah, sure, that's no worries. But he said, ah, oh, listening to what you're talking about with branding, I really, I've realized if I was to do a career change, my education CV is worthless. I have to recreate myself through a different lens. And just this week, a friend is going into coaching, and one of the steps she's using is the strengths finder. And I've never done that strengths finder stuff. And I always find some of those things you know like Myers-Briggs and DISC or whatever were like a fad that were invented and you know lived and died over a period of time and I sort of felt the same thing about strengths but having done it it was a really interesting process because it it made me realize that if I was going to rebrand myself for a career change you know doing your CV around your strengths would be a really interesting approach you could have bullet points as to where you worked on a very slim document but you know, actually putting together your professional profile through your strengths could be a really interesting approach. And I don't know that that wouldn't be relevant for education as well, you know. So I think the challenge there for us is to actually push the boundaries. You'll have to give the traditional CV and most agencies and most job hunting fairs, well, I still ask for that. But I think don't be fooled that that's going to be enough because it doesn't set you apart. And it's no different to what the colleges and universities are going through at the moment. Lots and lots of applications. How do we differentiate? They're all the same. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hi, Dana. Hey, Hello, everybody. welcome, uh, Ken. Yeah, it's good to be here. Hello, Paul, Steve, and Mike. Hey, hi, Ken. Hi, Ken. We're just starting the day here in Guatemala, so kids will be coming in in about 40 minutes or so. So I was just trying to get here before the um, the traffic got too bad. You know, I'm just listening. I was part of the first session here. And I was happy to think that, yes, I had a three-word brand that I created in 2017, which now I look at ISS and I'm like, hmm, where did they get that? Because mine was learn, connect, engage. And I think yours is like the same words, but not in the right order. (laughs) Not the right order, but whenever I talk about that in a setting about myself or in applying for jobs, I make it a very circular interwoven conversation because if when you're learning, you're connecting and you're engaged and I got a whole shtick. And then, you know, to your point, Dana, my name's Ken, who better than the Mattel Ken himself, right? So my tag is Eduken mm. at 55. I don't know, somebody got it at another time. 
But in listening to the social media platforms, like I do utilize Twitter as, I'm just talking now, by the way, um, as you know, my primary professional media source. And I've been reluctant to do Instagram because it's another thing. And I think our lives as educators and really any profession, I suppose, is, you know, they're very intertwined. And on the one hand, like my personal privacy and don't want to be cyber stalked. On the other hand, I know Instagram, especially for the younger educators out there, it's a really great source. And I am on both sides of the recruitment process. I appreciate what you were saying earlier, Paul, because when I recruit for teachers, I do go out and look for people. You know, I just don't rely on the top three website recruitment processes. And I've had good success with that. So I don't know if you have any other advice about having too much of a social media presence, but I do like the idea of the visual piece. And so perhaps creating a kind of montage, like in a portfolio of me teaching kindergarten in Rabat and me as a principal in Lincoln School in Kathmandu and what I do now, just to have it linked to my LinkedIn. I find LinkedIn to be a very powerful tool. They've only continued to get better. And I joined them actually when I wasn't teaching, but was an entrepreneur doing events. So it's been a long time, but I just, I guess, need to, the question I wanted to ask you as I came here today was really, what advice do you offer for somebody who's trying to leap into the next part of their career? I'm an elementary principal, 10-year admin who's trying to become a director. Mm -hmm. And I know my wheelhouse is not a school of a thousand, but a school of 500 or less would be great. And I've had good fortune to be a finalist at a couple of gigs. However. I'm up against some stiff competition. And so like, how do I set myself apart? I feel like I'm finding ways to do that, but it isn't until I get into the first step. Like I need to be able to do it right at the beginning. And that's got to either come in a video format or a really unique cover letter. I'm glad you're shaking your head, Mike. (laughs) I'm trying over here, but. uh... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know, in terms of how much is too much, I think it's a personal thing, you know, I'm a total advocate for social media and for people using it for good. But I've also seen people who've used Twitter, for example, thinking that they're profiling themselves in a more positive light, but in fact, they're actually portraying themselves in a more negative light. Mm-hmm. By just reposting someone else's post, that's like, hey, look what I found. You know, but reposting someone else's post with a question or a comment that might trigger a conversation and draw other people in, I think is a good way of thinking about because it's not just a flat page where you're just sticking a post-it on a wall. It's actually a motivator for a conversation, I think. That's where I find a lot of the people in my network, people who who see things that I, even I, if I comment on someone, like I mean the other day I commented on something on Passy Salberg's website and that four principals con- DM'd me privately and said, oh, I'm just interested to know about blah, blah, blah. You know, and So things like that where you just don't realize the value of the tool. It's not just about saying, put a photo in my photo album. It's actually saying, I wonder what the community thinks about this. And I wonder if this is important to other people as it is to me, because they're the things that I think people will see that will see your true sense, your true self in those kind of interactions. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, you know, one of the the suggestions I made in in, in the workshop was if you choose three things to articulate your brand, well, always post about those things Mm. those things they're that important to you make them rise to the top and you how do you do that by frequency you know like by just continuing to tag them continuing to you know you might become a bit annoying but it's it's building your profile you know like it's it's something that you really care about something that's meaningful yeah i think we've got to keep in mind that that the approach to hiring is changing and it's actually becoming more in some ways becoming more controlled, you know, with psychometric tests and on the spot responses, written responses, you know, I watched some of the processes my wife went through recently and it was just appalling. It was just like, oh, okay. You know, it's like they, they, if you survive this process, we might give you the job. (laughs) What else have we got? Did anyone notice anything in the, um, in the chat that, that required sort of a response or, Did you have more questions, Mike, from outside? Not really. I mean, I have a bunch for you right now. You do, Mike? Yeah. Did you want to ask something? No, I was going to say, 
I looked through um, the form that we had on the Ask Me Any Things and I didn't have any or in the feedback. We already asked the ones that were on there. So yeah, yeah we took it from it. Uh, the stars, the, the, the two star and the wish document. So we took, oh, yeah. yeah, we took from there. Right. But as we yeah. end off, I just have one question because uh, you, you spoke on rebranding. Okay. So I have like a two part question. I don't know if it's going to come out correctly, but mm -hmm. like I'm a hoarder of social media and a hoarder of skills. Right. So with the social media, I go back to social media as far as AOL, you know, MySpace. And in regards to skill sets, you know, I, my first job was like at Regals, you know, doing cashiers and stuff. So I want to know, like, you know, as being a hoarder, is at any point, is it OK to drop off of social media or to drop off a skill set? Oh, absolutely. But it's interesting. A lot of people don't understand when the skill sets actually contribute to a field that, you know, for example, when I was at ASIJ, we had a lot of students who were interested in a medical pathway to universities to be doctors or whatever. And so they would just load up in any course that might have had science or anything to do with science in it. And then they'd want to do these additional courses on holidays. And we would say to them, especially some of the kids that were a little bit timid, a little bit shy, or, and maybe even a little bit arrogant, we'd say to them, you don't need to do any more knowledge-based courses. You need to actually be put into a really challenging environment. Go and volunteer in an in a emergency room or go and work in a really, really busy cafe. You know, go and put yourself under a stress situation where you have to respond quickly. And those sort of things will contribute to your profile more meaningfully. So who would have thought a coffee shop stint would have, you know, helped a kid wanting to become a doctor? And that's not an absolute you know, example, but if the student can say, I did this thing over summer, you know, storytelling, I did this thing over summer in a coffee shop, it made me realize that blah, 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 you know, and this is going to be useful and transfer into that environment. So again, it's just about how you pull those skill sets and experiences into the story to tell the, you know, the meaningful little nugget of truth about you. And that's one of the things that I know that a lot of people you know, dislike Twitter for because it feels like it's all these people grandstanding and telling them how wonderful they are and all that sort of stuff. To a point, that's true. But what is also true is that you're actually exposing yourself by saying things like that on Twitter. And if they're not true, and we've had situations where people have contacted us about people who've applied for jobs and say, don't believe all that rubbish they put on Twitter. It's all a farce, you know? <laughs> so the tools are there to be used. And I think, you know, you have to be ethical in the way you use it. You have to be meaningful in the way you use it. And sure, if you don't want to put this massive, you know, montage together, that's just un undigestible. So, you know, be clever about how much you actually put out. But I think to Dana's point and to my reference as well, if you can't find anything about people on the internet, then they probably haven't arrived at the century yet. You know, they probably haven't, or they've, you know, they've they've taken a different pathway and they're maybe coming in the, you know, the the dirt track, or the down the mountain track or something. But I think it's important that that people have engaged in this stuff to an extent. And it's clear and obvious that they're using it for a purpose, not just using it for everything, you know, which is why I've been divorcing so your personal life from from it and you know, keeping these things bespoke to certain aspects of your career orientation then you know they're fairly useful well to piggyback on one thing that you said real quick is i had a student back when i was in bangkok and we did a week without walls and we did a service in safari so we worked with a school um, which was an orphanage for kids whose parents were hiv positive and and a lot of them were hiv positive and then we also did like a safari so anyway this one student had been applying to all different colleges and she was a good student she like wasn't like the top whatever, whatever, but she was a really solid student, but she wasn't getting into the colleges that she wanted. But as part of like our Week Without Walls thing is she kept an ongoing journal on her e-portfolio of all of her experiences at this orphanage that we worked with. And so much so that she went back there the next summer and she went back there like the next Christmas, like it became a part of who she was. She loved working with this organization in this group. And literally one college said, when we read that, you had us in tears, you're in. And she was like, what? <laughs> like, I did not expect that to be the thing that was going to get me in. 
but she had sent them just a link to her e-portfolio and they got to see her behind just the grades and like what a phenomenal human being this person, mm. the student was. And I think if you can show people windows into who you are and what you believe and tell your story, wherever you choose to tell your story, that really helps people understand who they're committing to. Yeah. To that point, like one of the students we had in Tokyo in, at ASOJ was, you know, she was a science math kid. She'd done all the courses that we had on offer she'd done everything that goa had that we we could offer her through there and she came to me and she wanted to do more courses over summer and i said why don't you do a personal project why don't you do you know we had this thing in the timetable called it was called per se it was called personal project but what it was was just a spare period where you would sit outside a teacher's classroom and they would supervise you and you could do whatever you wanted to and it wasn't terribly rich so we took that and turned it into a a mentored approach and with this girl we just said to her, what are you interested in? And she said, well, I'm, I'm really interested in chemistry and I really love cooking. I mean, went, right. <laughs> and so she did her project on molecular gastronomy. First thing she did was she went to her chemistry teacher and she said, oh, you know, I'm going to do, I've just decided what I'm going to do now. It's this. And the chemistry teacher said, oh, good. Well, you just need to buy this textbook and this kit and this resource and, and you know, you'll have plenty of information. And she came oh. back to me and she said, oh, I'm all sorted. I've got it all sorted. And I said, no, you haven't. It's fine. Your teacher's not going to be your mentor. I haven't worked that out yet. How are we going to do that? She said, well, who will be my teacher? And I said, I want you to go home and hashtag molecular gastronomy and come and see me in the morning, which she did. And she came back with her eyes like this. And she said, I can't believe it. There's a chef in the restaurant down the end of my street who's one of the top molecular gastronomists in this country. <laughs> and it was just that one action of knowing that I can choose a hashtag to go and find a network of interest was just an incredible skill for her. And it was actually a turning point because she had no idea what she wanted to do. She knew she was going to get a, get into a good university. She got into Stanford and it was on the merit of her personal project because they loved the interdisciplinary nature of it. What she ended up doing was creating 10 YouTube videos, instructional videos on burning questions like why does lime neutralize chili? What happens when you caramelize sugar? And she did a mixture of experiments and interviews with kids and walking around so here taste this chili oh it's hot you know what happens when we put lime on your tongue you know things like that it was very very low tech and low brow but it was wonderful and stanford said to her it's journalism it's personal traits it's science it's fun <laughs> we want you <laughs> so you know no, that's to me you. leveraging the tools that we have to yeah yeah no, thank you so much for sharing paul uh, i see the time I'm taking a look at the time Looks like our 30 minutes is up, but just wanted to say thank you for coming in here to share your, uh, your knowledge with us today. Uh, what I got out of it is a go and tell a better story. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everyone else. Thank you for joining in today for our episode two. You can find us on Podcast, Spotify, and all of the popular podcast platforms that are out there. Until next time, bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thank bye, you. everyone. <laughs>